today's draft. The most controversial calls, the most controversial plays in NFL history, inspired by the thing that I have to see multiple times every Friday when Shireen's on with that Staubach jersey hanging in the background. Shireen, ask me the trivia question, and we'll decide who gets the first pick. What color is blue, Mike? No, who is the Cowboys' all-time leading receiver? Yards and catches. All-time leading receiver. Yards and catches. All-time leading receiver. Yards and catches. My goodness. Is it Michael Irvin? Is it Michael Jason Irvin? Witten. Uh, Jason Witten. Oh, Jason Witten. Witten. Oh, trick question. Trick question. We're talking about receivers and 88s and whatnot. Yes, well, that makes sense. Yeah. Jason Witten's up there high on the all-time catches and yardage list uh, for all players, regardless of position. All right, you get the first pick. Do you know who the TD leader is for the Cowboys? Jason Witten is, is one Michael off Irvin? of that mark. It's Jason. It is Des is it, Bryant. Is it Michael Irvin? Oh, Des Bryant. No. Des Bryant. Amazing. Uh, considering they didn't throw to him the last three years he was there, it's amazing. All right, you get the first pick. <laughs> I get the first pick on the most controversial plays. There are so many ways you can go with this, but I think you have to go with the immaculate reception, which stands as one of the greatest plays in NFL history, and it was only controversial because of the rule back then, which has since changed, that two offensive players could not touch the ball at the same time. And, of course, the Raiders contend that Frenchie Fuqua touched the ball, and I don't see how it's physically possible that he could have touched this ball. Uh, But that's what they contend to this day, that they won that game. And, of course, the Steelers ended up upsetting them in the final seconds uh, as Franco Harris carried to, to the end zone. And the Steelers owner at that time, Art Rooney, was actually in the elevator at the time. He had conceded that the Raiders were going to win the game. So he went on down to the sideline to console the team and gets out of the elevator and says, hey, what happened? Well, that happened. So they were still talking about whether it was a controversy or not. At least they still are in Oakland and I guess now in Las Vegas. I never saw that aspect of it as controversial, though, because it's so obvious to me that it didn't hit Frenchie Fuqua first. And what a dumb rule that was in the first place. It was a dumb that, rule. That that you can't have an offensive, an eligible receiver. It's one thing if it's an ineligible receiver. This, that's still the rule. You can't have an offensive lineman reach up and bat the ball to a, an eligible receiver. But an eligible receiver can't touch the ball before another teammate catches it. It's ridiculous. But even then... The ball ricochets off the Raiders player's shoulder pad. I, I, I never. I, to me, the bigger controversy is: does the ball touch the ground when when Franco Harris scoops it up? Because there's no shot of that, uh, and uh, that is forever resolved by the fact that they have a statue of Franco Harris making that catch at the Pittsburgh International Airport, and the ball isn't touching the ground. So there's the proof: the ball did not touch the ground when he made that catch. But that is one of the all-time great plays. But to me, the stakes weren't as high because the Steelers didn't go on to win the Super Bowl that year. It would be two more years. I go with the same team on the wrong side of the bad call, on the wrong side of the controversial call. 20 years after the fact, 2001, division around playoffs, the snow globe game, the epic final game ever played at the Patriots Stadium before they moved to Gillette, the tuck rule game where, where Charles Woodson hits Tom Brady, the ball comes out, And it looks like a fumble. It feels like a fumble. Anything anyone ever knew about football up until that point directed it to the outcome of a fumble. And then that's the night that we learn about the tuck rule where and and it was a proper application of the rule until the ball is tucked back into the the gut of the quarterback when he's in that throwing motion. If the ball comes out, it's an incomplete pass. So it was a bad rule that was applied correctly to the chagrin of Raiders fans. And they eventually changed the rule like more than 10 years after the fact so they could get fully clear of the controversy. You don't want to change it right away and admit what a dumb rule it was, but it was the proper application of a bad rule. Well, Mike, I was sitting in a a sports bar in St. Louis because I was covering a Rams game uh, the next day, a playoff game, and I immediately said, that's the tuck rule. That's the tuck rule. And everybody's looking at me like, what are you talking about the tuck rule? But it had happened earlier in the season. And I can't tell you now who, who it happened to earlier in the season, but I had seen it earlier in the season enough to know that that play was going to be overturned. Yes. And that was number two on my list. One of the most controversial plays in NFL history. And I'm going to go to, of course, God, there's so many, but I'm going to go back to 2014. Did Dez catch it or not? And the, the, that rule, again, is another one that was changed. And now we say, yes, if it was applied to this year, 
that was a catch that Des made at the one yard line uh, late in that game. It was a fourth down play uh, with a little over four minutes to play. Now, I have argued with Cowboys officials over the years that the Cowboys still would not have won that game, even if they had scored a touchdown from the one yard line, because there was too much time for Aaron Rodgers. He would have gone back down, which he did. He ran out the clock but they would have gone back down and and scored and won that game. Maybe they would have, maybe they wouldn't have. That's what I argued, that the Packers still would have won that game. But applied to today's rules, Dad's caught that ball, and I think it was a huge controversy. At least it was a huge controversy here and remains a controversy today. Hey, Shireen, based on the rules that were enforced at the time, I think he caught that ball. One of the things I've always argued is there was not sufficient video evidence to overturn the ruling on the field. And the ruling was made. You saw the official right there looking right at it. You have to have indisputable visual evidence. They've changed the clear and obvious since then that the, the ruling on the field was incorrect. You do not have the evidence to overturn the judgment exercised by the official in that moment that he made the catch. That was my argument then, and it's still my argument. Old rules, new rules, any rules, that's a catch. That should have stood, regardless of what Aaron Rodgers would have done with his opportunity. And it was an excellent throw by Tony Romo. Not as good of a throw, though, as the one Roger Staubach made to Drew Pearson before he pushed <laughs> Nate right down. All right, the next one for me, and I'm surprised it's still on the board after three picks. The the play that changed the rules to a point where they didn't know how to enforce the rules. And now we're back to where we were two years ago, the saints Rams NFC championship game debacle, the missed pass interference call, the reaction to that deafening the NFL's effort to try to address that situation last year, completely and totally inadequate. And now we are exactly where we were. That donut hole exists again. It can still happen that you can have the officials miss a blatant incident of pass interference and there is no way to fix it within the rules. Now, you could have Al Riveron open up the pipeline like he should have done at the time. And even though the rules don't allow the head of officiating to say to the referee, I think you should drop a flag. I am very Machiavelli when it comes to getting it right. I don't care what the process is. Just get it right. And I'd like to think if they're ever encountered with something like that again, without a rule in place to fix it, they use that pipeline from 345 Park Avenue to the game site and say, drop the flag and call it interference to avoid that from happening again. And I think their attitude is something like that's only going to happen once every 100 years. It'll be somebody else's problem by the time it ever happens again. Yeah, and all the plays we're talking about, Mike, are in the playoffs, which is why they're so significant. And, and you know, you have the fail Mary and you have the Vinny Testaverde helmet ball crossing the goal line there on fourth down. You have a lot of those plays, but the plays we were talking about are so significant because they eliminated one team and allowed the other team, in many cases, to go on and win a championship. And, and it didn't happen for the Rams to win the championship, but I think the Saints still feel like if they could have gotten to the Super Bowl, they had a chance to win the Super Bowl. So, yes, that one was very high on my list. I actually had it at number two and, and shifted gears and did the Des, did he catch it or not, since we were kind of on the Cowboys track. But my, my third choice is going to be the 1979 playoff game between Houston and Pittsburgh, and Mike Renfro has become something of a friend of mine, and, and uh, he still says he catches caught it against Pittsburgh. It looked like he caught a touchdown. Of course, there was no replay back then. The officials didn't signal one way or another whether he made a touchdown or not. They consulted and said it was an incomplete pass, uh, that he didn't get both feet down. It's very obvious that he got both feet down. It would have tied the Steelers in the second half. Steelers went on to win that game and, of course, won a Super Bowl uh, in the championship game. But I think the Oilers would have had a good chance to win a championship if they could have gotten that catch. Maybe they lose that game, but we'll never know. But Mike Renfro definitely got both feet down. Yeah, that was the second straight AFC championship game between the Oilers and the Steelers back when that was one of the great rivalries in all of football. And the Steelers, if I recall correctly, easily beat them on like a snowy, slushy, icy day the year before, right? But it was that next year where the Oilers got screwed and there were multiple bad calls or at least questionable calls in that game. All right, last one for me, and there's still a lot I can go with, and I can't believe... I can't believe I, I you know what I've I've exhausted my lifetime limit of talking about the Hail Mary play and because there's nothing that I'm ever going to say that's going to change it. So I'm going to go I'm going to go with the Music City Miracle. Uh, that's one that's still you know, you still see that 
highlight of Frank Wycheck throwing the ball across the field to Kevin Dyson, and it still looks like a forward pass, even though everyone insists it wasn't. And that that's why it was such a stunning moment. I remember it's one of those very rare NFL. I know exactly where I was when that happened because it was unbelievable that the then Titans found a way to pull a rabbit out of the hat and beat the Bills in advance in the postseason. But it's still, when you look at it, it still looks like a forward pass, not a lateral, uh, Shireen. Yeah, and a- another playoff one I think we have to mention, Mike, is the Bert Emanuel catch, which changed, led to change rules that the Buccaneers likely would have beaten the Rams in that championship game uh, if that play had been correctly called. It was applied to the rules then, but I'm glad the rule has changed on what a catch is. It, it only took him 20 years to get that rule right, though, inspired by the Bert Emanuel play. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.